Week one, we talked about stewarding more. Week two, we talked about stewarding money. Week three, Pastor Adam in the trilogy talked about stewarding margin. Week four, last week, Aaron Williams, the CFO, A-Dub, talked about stewarding meekness. And this week, your Filipino brother from another mother wants to talk about stewarding meaning, stewarding meaning. Because I believe this, if you get meaning right, you'll get generosity right. If you get your purpose right, you'll understand how to steward God's provision. And I'm not talking about tithing this morning because that's not generosity. That's simple obedience. Biblical generosity is going above and beyond. It's, it's going over the top. It's a revelation that there is more meaning to money than just for myself. We're talking about meaning and generosity this morning. And there was a, a character that came to mind to me this past week when I thought about a character in the Bible that had incredible meaning, deep meaning, and a mission for his life. And his name is Nehemiah in the Old Testament. So let's stay standing for just a little bit longer, and I want to take us through this passage. If you don't know the story of Nehemiah, he was an incredible builder. He was called by God to build the nation of God, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And the king anointed him with resources and gave him the people that he needed to be able to accomplish his mission. But Nehemiah, on the way to accomplish this mission, started to recognize some issues and some problems within the community. And this is where we pick it up, Nehemiah chapter 5. I'm reading from the New Living Translation version. So follow along with me. It says this, about this time, of the men and their wives raised a cry of protest against their fellow Jews. They were saying, we have such large families, we need more food to survive. Others said, we have mortgaged our fields, vineyards, and homes to get food during the famine. And others said, we had to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay for our taxes. We belong to the same family as those who are wealthy and our children are just like theirs, yet we gotta sell our children into slavery just to get enough money to live. We've already sold our daughters, that's devastating. And we are helpless to do anything about it for our fields and vineyards are already mortgaged to others. Chapter six, when I heard their complaints, I was very angry, Nehemiah said. After thinking it over, I spoke out against these nobles and officials. I told them, you are hurting your own relatives by charging interest when they borrow money. Then I called a public meeting to deal with the problem. Leaders deal with problems. Chapter 8, at the meeting I said to them, we're going to do all that we redeem to Jewish re relatives who have had to sell themselves, but are you selling them back into slavery again? How often must we redeem them? And they had nothing to say in their defense. Skip over to verse 12. They replied, we will give back everything and demand nothing more from the people. We will do as you say, Nehemiah. Then I called the priests and made the nobles and officials swear to do what they had promised. I shook the folds of my robe and said, if you fail to keep your promise, may God shake you like this from your homes and from your property. He don't play. The whole assembly responded to that with a resounding amen, and they praised the Lord, and the people did as they promised. What an interesting passage that reveals the human condition, doesn't it? Yes. Selfishness, self-interest, greed. And Nehemiah sees the greed in the community and decides to put a stop to it, which tells me if you want to set a pattern of generosity in your life, you first have to confront the greed that's in the way. Because the very Spirit of God is to give more than you take. So my question for us today is what will it take to have a community that lives to give? I want to tackle this question with a sermon we're entitling Cash Money. Cash Money. Let's pray one more time. Lord God, I thank you, God, that we stand on your word. Your principle says that the world of the generous gets larger and larger. So would you enlarge us? Would you expand our thinking? Would you break off limitation right now? In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. 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 Give God some glory one more time. Why don't you high five like seven people before you take your seat in the presence of God here in Vive Mountain View. It's so good to be here and everybody online joining as well. I got a question for us this morning. Has something ever meant 
something to you a little bit more than it should have? I'm talking to the San Francisco 49er fans. If, if you're a fan of a sports team and every game is high stakes and it means so much, maybe a little bit too much. I'm not going to name any names, Medi. Maybe you could admit this morning that you're a little bit too competitive and what's meant to be a fun social game of mafia turns friends into enemies because winning means a little bit too much. I'm not going to name any names, Pastor Carly. <laughs> These are the struggles of life. Meaning can be a blessing and a burden, or it can mean both. For example, this past week, my daughter Lennox, who is six years old, my eldest daughter, had her annual jogathon had her annual jog. And you would know this by now that I'm a triathlete, which means I'm a runner, which means it runs in the family. So Lennox is definitely going to win this jogathon. <laughs> this jogathon, it it meant so much to us. I mean, it meant so much to me because because you know, winning this jogathon basically is going to mean her getting the confidence to propel into her calling which is to be an athlete and get a full ride scholarship to a prestigious university like Stanford University and major in business and go to graduate school and get her MBA, minor in entrepreneurship so she can take on the family business and become CEO of Overflow in 16 years time. That's what this jogathon means. We had it all mapped out. I had a training program a week before. We would go out into the neighborhood and we would run around the neighborhood and I would give her the family trade secrets. I would give her world-class tips and tricks so she would have the advantage at this jogathon. She did it last year, actually. So Kim had videos that we were re-reviewing. We had game film, y'all. We had game take. I kid you not. We were psyching her up. Lenny, we got, th I mean, you got this. You're gonna be amazing. Remember all of our training. I'm giving her a baguette in the morning to carb load. Two bottles of water to stay hydrated. We're stretching. I'm massaging her little calves. I'm telling you, we walk up to this school with such a swagger because there is no way anybody is as prepared as Lennox, the Flash Roush. I mean, Lennox Olivia Roush. It meant so much to us. I'm strategizing with her in the fence and I'm telling her, hey, you need to position yourself in the inside lane because the same amount of laps is less work. Work smarter, not harder. <laughs> Parents are trying to connect with us. I don't wanna hear that. I'm focused <laughs> on the task at hand. Three, two, one, starting gun goes off and Lennox is off to the races. And my goodness, the form, man, it must run in the family, taking after her dad, definitely not her mom, but taking after her dad and we literally strategically placed myself, Kim, and Uncle John at different portions of the track. So at each juncture, she has encouragement and a hydration station so that she would win this jogathon. She ran and she ran and she ran her heart out. She gave it all that she had. 15 minutes later, 24 laps down, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, she sprinted to the very end. And can I tell you, we were so proud of her. The way she applied herself, the way she put in the work, her level of focus around the mission that, I was, that, uh, that was at hand. It brought a level of tenacity. And, you know, you might be thinking maybe this meant a little bit too much to you and Kim Vance. But I'm here to tell you that when you frame something with meaning, it brings a certain mission to the journey. This level of tenacity and determination, the spirit of togetherness in our family, it empowered her to give it all that she had. And she didn't win that day, likely it was rigged. <laughs> but she did exceed all of our expectations. Can I submit to you, that's what generosity feels like. Generosity isn't the minimum, it goes above and beyond. Generosity sees the need, but it exceeds the need. 
Generosity is extravagant. It is over the top. Generosity has a fragrance. It has a feeling. It has a ro- aroma. It has an atmosphere. It carries an attitude. Generosity inspires. It elevates. It calls us higher. It is the opportunity to give it all that we got. It's a beautiful invitation to live a life that is beyond yourself. And this invitation comes from receiving, accepting, and stepping into a life on mission. To step into a life of meaning. And this is what Nehemiah chose. Nehemiah was a man on mission. He chose to take upon the call of God on his life to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, which at that time was a representation of God's kingdom. He was called to build a whole nation. But as context, before he got that call, he was on mission for his job. Before he got his call, he stewarded his current position at the time, which the Bible tells us was a cupbearer. He had a prominent position in the king's cabinet as a cupbearer. If you don't know what a cupbearer is, it was like a sommelier. It was somebody that would curate wine and taste wine and make sure the king had the best of the best. But not just a sommelier. It would be a selfless position because in that time, oftentimes people would try to poison the king. So he would taste the wine first before it got to the king, which means that on a daily basis he was putting himself in harm's way for another. Nehemiah, the Bible indicates, did not just hold this position, but explains to us that he must have done his job faithfully because the Bible tells us he had favor with the king, which seems to be a little bit of a lesson in and of itself, doesn't it? That we want to ask for favor from God, but ask, God is asking us for his, our faithfulness. See, Nehemiah had favor with the king while being faithful in his job. Generosity is the first one in, last one out. Generosity is not stopping what you were paid for by man, but recognizing that you do it unto God. Generosity is not quiet quitting and doing the bare minimum. It's understanding I'm going to do the work when nobody is watching because there's a deeper meaning and integrity to this thing. Nehemiah was faithful which garnered the favor of the highest ranking official of that time in the known world. And while Nehemiah wasn't in his ultimate calling yet, God was establishing him and preparing him for it. See, before Nehemiah's calling, he was a cupbearer, but probably the best cupbearer at that. He probably approached his job like an incredible craft, not just a sommelier, but taking it next level like a master sommelier, not obsessed with what's next, but maybe focused on honoring God with what's now. Because the way he stewarded his role as cupbearer unlocked the next level of his calling, unlocked the next season of what God called him to. So I have a question for us today. What cup are we willing to bear for our calling? What season are you in right now that deserves your attentiveness and your excellence? Your current season at a company might not be your ultimate calling, but maybe it's there to cultivate character. Your season as a parent might not be glamorous today, but I rest assured that it is to bring glory to God. Your current season of cup bearing, what if it's just conditioning for your ultimate calling? See, after seasons of serving, after years of serving the king, God suddenly deposits a mission and a mandate onto Nehemiah's life to build a whole nation. And what's so cool is the story would go on in Nehemiah that he asked for resources from the king and the king gave generously towards him. Isn't that interesting? When you cultivate an atmosphere of generosity in your life, it doesn't just flow out of you, it can flow to you and through you to achieve the mission that God has for you. And so they were well on their way, but they were met with incredible opposition. He had resources, he had people, but there was so much external pressure 
for them to build the wall from neighboring cities and mockers and the culture just opposing them. But that wasn't the thing that was stopping them. There was one problem that he identified that was slowing them down, and it wasn't external pressure. It was actually internal greed. It was the wealthy within the church, within the community that was making loans to the poor. It was the well-off taking advantage of those that didn't have enough. And Nehemiah knew that he had to address this problem if they were going to start a new pattern of generosity. And that's my first point this morning. You can write this down. Generosity runs towards problems, not away from problems. See, if we revisit verse 6, it says, When I heard their complaints, Nehemiah said, I was very angry. After thinking it over, I spoke out against these nobles and officials. I told them, you are hurting your own relatives by charging interest when they borrow money. Then I called a public meeting to deal with the problem. Generosity runs towards the problem. Generosity understands its responsibility. Generosity understands that we need to seize the opportunities that are in front of us. And Nehemiah was dealing with a lot of problems. He was dealing with external pressure. He was dealing with political forces, with media narratives. He was dealing with a culture that wanted to oppose the kingdom of God. That kind of sounds like 2022, doesn't it? That there is a culture that is not just opposed to Christianity, but hostile towards its values. And as, I, as they are building God's walls, which represented God's ways, they were met with external pressure. But every time in the Bible there's external pressure, there's an even greater acceleration and advancement of his kingdom. That's why when we are in a society and a culture that is opposing us so strongly, you better get excited that he's about to do an accelerated work in the church because we are going to advance. And the Bible says the gates of hell cannot, will not prevail against it. So he wasn't actually concerned about the external pressure because that actually accelerates the church. The only thing that can slow down the church is internal greed. And that's the thing that he needed to address, the pyramid schemes, the loan sharks, the spirit of leveraging relationships for personal gain. See, Nehemiah knew that greed was in direct opposition to giving so that if he wanted to build a people that was gonna fulfill their purpose, he had to resolve this issue. Jesus teaches us, right, in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. You can't have both. So he addresses this problem of greed, and each of the officials receive it and fully restore back to the people what they stole, what they took. That step of solving the problem allowed Nehemiah to step into his rightful position. And, and this is my second point. You can write this down. Generosity leverages position to give more than it takes. Generosity will allow you to step into positions where you will give more then you take. If we go on in the passage to verse 14, for the entire 12 years, the Bible says, that I was governor of Judah, this is Nehemiah, for the 20th year to the 32nd year, neither I nor my officials drew on our official food allowance. After Nehemiah rooted out greed, the Bible says he took on his position as governor. And he took on this position for 12 years, which is interesting to me because 12 is the number of authority. 12 is the number of completion. 12 is the number that signifies that you can establish a new pattern. For 12 years, he established an authority to set a new pattern, not of greed, but of generosity. Why? Because as governor, he was entitled to tax the people. 
As governor, he was entitled to his fair share. He was entitled to a royalty. But he saw that model in the past bring the people poverty. So he decides to flip the whole script, to flip the model, not to take from the people, but to give to the people and create a sense of ownership. If we skip down to verse 16, he says, I devoted myself to working on the wall and refused to acquire any land in the process. And I required all of my servants, all of my workforce, all of my officials, all of my army to spend time working on the wall. I asked for nothing, even though I regularly fed 150 Jewish officials at my table besides all the other visitors in the land. So Nehemiah didn't take his rightful share. Nehemiah didn't take a tax on the people. Nehemiah didn't take his fair royalty that he was deserved. Instead, he reinvested it back into the people. He reinvested it back into the community so that they could be more effective in building the church, more effective in building the wall, more effective at advancing God's kingdom. What does this mean? His workforce wasn't malnourished anymore. The builders were now healthy because they were eating good at the king's table. The people were more energized for the work. The people were now motivated to pursue and complete the mission. See, greed is short-sighted, but generosity thinks about generations. Greed leads to poverty, but generosity leads to abundance. Greed will take, generosity will give and multiply. I don't know about you, but I feel the very spirit of God on Vive Church to be one where generosity flows, where opportunities are shared, where the people of God take the rightful position to set new patterns, not of greed, but of generosity, a people that will give more than we take. I'm not just talking about finances. I'm, I'm speaking of all aspects of our life. Giftings, talent, connections, wisdom, insight. What is in your hand that God is calling you to give? Because God is not limited. I don't know about you, but I visit some businesses sometimes that, that are a little bit limited in their thinking. I'm specifically talking about the cash-only businesses. And I could talk about this because this is my Asian people doing it. And, and I'm like, where's the ATM? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't carry cash anywhere. And, and I get it, I get it. There's different reasons to have a cash-only business. But if the reason is primarily so that you can report less on taxes, so that you have a lower tax bill, yeah, people are like, wow, that's what they do? Yes, that's what they do. <laughs> then you might save a few bucks on taxes, but can I tell you, you're severely limiting your business opportunity. God has not called us to a cash-only business. God has not called the people of God to a cash-only mentality. God has not called us to scarcity. God has called us to abundance. God has called us to generosity. God has called us to lift the lid off limitation. We are not going to run scared and hide away our resources and, and pretend like we don't got nothing so that we don't have to share anything. The Bible says, give and it will be given, not keep so it doesn't get lost. <laughs> give and it will be given. Give and it will be given, not get so that you can give. Give and it will be given. The world says, get, get, get. For what's me? The Bible says, give, 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 because it wasn't mine in the first place. Yeah. See, the spirit of stinginess will keep you stuck. The spirit of stinginess will keep you small. The spirit of stinginess will keep you limited. The spirit of generosity will enlarge your world. Proverbs eleven twenty four. the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. And I'm betting the farm on this principle. I've invested all of my money to start a company based on this first principle truth. Why have I done this? Because my security is not in my career. It's shored up in my calling. 
Ephesians 1.14 says, the spirit of God, the spirit of generosity, the spirit of giving is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance. <laughs> you know you're entitled to an inheritance that he promised that he has purchased to be his own people. He did this, why? So that you would praise him and that you would glorify him. We're called to glorify him. And the best ways I've seen that done in the church community is through giving. Is through giving. I mentioned our company, it's called Overflow. And my wife and I, we started this company. It's a financial technology company that serves churches and nonprofits with new ways to be able to receive generosity from its people so that they can accelerate the mission and the vision that they have. And it's such a blessing to be able to have the grace to be able to build this company and the resources to be able to build this company. But God spoke to me in a vision very clearly, something very unorthodox in the early days of our company as we were establishing it. I've talked about before how as a company, we give 10% of our revenue back to the community because we can't lead anybody anywhere. We haven't been ourselves and we do that 10% of revenue, not profit, because ain't no startups make money. And so we give 10%, of, but, but more than that, what God spoke to me is to actually dedicate a portion of my company to Vive. It's to actually have Vive on the cap table. Because I wanted to have a predetermined posture to give because when you have a predetermined posture to give to God, it creates a pathway to give glory to God. And I'm here to remind you that you can't outgive God. I'm here to refresh you on the fact that as you build God's house, He is faithful to build your house. We started Overflow two and a half years ago, and because of the grace of God, this year alone, we will see over $100 million donated through our platform, primarily to the local church, so that his kingdom, so that his walls, so that his church, so that his people can continue to advance all across the world. And the reason I share that is because as a platform like ours hits that type of volume, it becomes a lot more valuable. So as the equity value of our company rises, the gift amount to God house increases. And our finance and our legal team is monitoring this, and they keep challenging me to reconsider what I committed. But what I committed is in contract and cannot be reneged because I wanted it to be in the fabric of our company because this company is not ours. This company is submitted to the glory of God. I want to prophesy right now that over this vision season, as we head into vision season here at Vive Church, God is going to be calling people in this room right now that's listening to this message to move in ways you've never moved before, to give in ways you've never thought about giving before, to step out in faith in ways you've never stepped out in faith before. It could be in the realm of entrepreneurship. It could be in the realm of serving. It could be in the realm of boldness. It most certainly is in the realm of generosity. I know that to be true. And you'll know this. You'll know God is calling you because it's going to scare you. You know God is calling you because you're going to feel challenged and it's going to be uncomfortable. You know God is calling you because you're going to start facing resistance and opposition. But God gives vision in those conditions because he doesn't want you to be able to do it on your own. He calls it the vision gap. He calls it the God gap. He calls it the opportunity to be able to partner with you to bring about glory on this planet through him. And I'm so thankful that God grants us as members of this church, as Christians, vision. Because when he does that, he always on the other side has the provision. And that's my third and final point as we close. 
Generosity solves problems. Generosity takes its rightful position. And out of generosity flows provision. If you go to verse 18 in the passage we've been unpacking today, it says this, the provisions I paid for each day included one ox, six choice sheep and goats, and a large number of poultry. And every 10 days, just for kicks, we need a large supply of wine. I love it. God loves to party. (laughs) Did you know that God doesn't want to stop with your finances? This verse is indicating that he has a diversity of ways that he wants to provide for your needs. You need ox? We got one. You need a goat, some sheep? We got six of those. You want some wine? Let's party. I got that too. There's so many different ways he wants to provide for you, not just financially, but for your family. He doesn't just want to take care of money issues. He wants to take care of marriage issues. He wants to meet every need, but not just meet every need, exceed every need, because we serve a God that does exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine. But it's when you tap into the plans and the purposes of God that he wants to creatively provide, to bring provision. Our God is not limited. Our God does not tap out on his generosity. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things, not some of these things, and all these things, not a portion of these things, and all these things, not just a couple of these things, all of these things will be added unto you. He is faithful. He is faithful. You know, he can't wait for you to live a life of generosity. You know, he can't wait for you to live the way that you were created to live. He can't wait for you to operate in your original design and your wiring. Because as generosity flows through you, as you get creative with it, as you get called to it, God sees that it can flow from you, so then it can freely flow flow to you. He can't wait to bless you. He is a good father. This is the economy of heaven. This is the economy of the kingdom. This is a distinctive of the church. This is the way that he advances his people. We are called to a lifestyle of generosity. We live to give. It's in our nature. It's who we are. It's who you are. It's what you're called to be. In an unassuming chapter in the Bible, Nehemiah models how to root out greed and how to start new patterns of generosity. That's so cool. But he ends it with such an interesting statement, request, desire for God. If you Flip with me to verse 19. Check this out. It ends in such an interesting fashion. He says this. After all of that, after the 12 years of setting new patterns, after the confrontation with his officials, after living a life of generosity that would be infused into the people, he says this in verse 19. Remember, oh my God, all that I have done for these people... And God, would you bless me for it? Isn't that us? God, I'm I'm doing this for you. Would you you see me? God, I want to live for you. Would you you bless me? God, I've, I've been faithful. Would you have favor on me? God, would you remember me? And I have such good news for you, church. This desire for meaning, when you choose Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you no longer have to strive for. You inherit it. You already have meaning when you decide that Jesus is your Lord and Savior because you become his son, you become his daughter, you become his heir, a parent. Lennox, just the other day, a couple days ago, she turns to me in the car and she goes, Dad, remember the jogathon? 
And I could tell she was trying to lock eyes because her eyes, I could tell, were asking me for approval and acceptance. Dad, did you remember the jogathon? And not because she won the jogathon, not because of her performance in the jogathon, I assured her I'll never forget. Not because of her performance, but because she has her rightful position as my daughter. You have a rightful position in Christ. You are a son. You are a daughter. When you're living a life of generosity, you're not living for meaning. You're living from meaning. You already have all the meaning that you need. You, you carry his name. You're a Christian. You are Christ-like. That's, that's the name that you carry. That's who God sees. It's, it's Jesus.